Hi everybody, uh, I'm glad to be given the honor to present our findings uh, for the clover audit. So I'll just like jump straight into it. Uh, so we did the audit in January uh, this year, right? Uh, January 2nd to the 13th, and there was a two and a half week uh, fixed period, right? So the team comprised of me, of uh, Christoph, me, Trotto, Taik, and Grumpy Ninja. Right, and uh, the product went live on the 13th of Feb, initially on Polygon, and uh, I believe they launched subsequently on other networks as well. Right, so what exactly makes uh, Clobber uh, stand out from your traditional uh, DEX or uh, order books, right? Uh, on chain order book models, right? So, they are, uh, what they do is that they aim to reduce the, the linear overhead of taking uh, for taker orders, right? The reason is that uh, the computation cost of a taker order increases proportionally to the number of maker orders it is matched with, right? So that's the main problem that they are tackling. So they try to be uh, as gas efficient when uh, a taker comes in to take orders. So uh, their next uh, like notable feature is that uh, for every price index, or if you are familiar with UniVishi, you have the price ticks, right? Uh, each price index can store up to two, the, 2 to the power of 15 orders, right? And uh, why exactly is 2 to the power of 15? is because of the custom data structure that they used, right? So I, I won't dive too deeply into the custom data structures. Um, uh, that one you can like read the code yourself <laughs> because it's uh, rather complex, right? Um, and uh, what they do is that they track the aggregated liquidity at the price level instead of iterating through each maker order, right? So the custom structures that they use are the segmented segment tree, which is used to track the liquidity depth and the octopus uh, to track initialized uh, price indexes. So when you're jumping from one price index, you want to find what's the next price index that has liquidity. Uh, that's what the octopus heap is used for. A few other features to note is that uh, it's a first in first out uh, for maker orders, right? So earlier maker orders will get filled first. And regarding order settlement, uh, the token transfers only happen to the, on the taker side, right? So the taker, like, he, when he fills the order, right? Uh, he deposits, he will exchange his token, but for the maker, uh, they will have to claim separately through another uh, transaction. And uh, maker orders are represented by NFTs. So when you transfer the NFT, you are also transferring the rights to claim uh, the field order. With that, let's jump into some of the findings and uh, learning points, right? So the objective I have for this presentation isn't really just to explain the findings that we made, but I also like to talk about some key takeaways, some learning points uh, out of the audit that might help you guys become uh, better auditors, right? In other words, auditing alpha tips. Right, so the first uh, bug that we'll look at is this addition overflow in the segmented segment tree. Uh, let me just give a quick primer on segment trees. So it is a, you are able to quickly do a lookup for range query over an array, right? Uh, and uh, in, in other words, you are trying to find the sum of consecutive uh, sub array elements. So for example, we have an array of four elements here, uh, five, two, three, and seven. So these elements will fill the leaves of the binary tree. Right, and then uh, you know the intermediate uh, uh, nodes like the the ones in orange, right? Uh, the the seven uh, will is because it's the sum of uh, the elements from zero to one, and for ten is because it's the sum of the elements from two to three, right? So uh, you know with this you are able to quickly make a range query from uh, index i to index j. So for example, if you want to find the sum of elements uh, one indexes one, two, and three, then you know you be able to take like uh, for example the element one and then you add that together with uh, the orange one, which is two and three, right? Instead of having to individually sum them up. Right. So I won't explain exactly how you perform the range query, how you update the tree because uh, all these would be covered in a separate uh, computer science lecture, right? And I'm pretty sure there are YouTube videos out there for you to watch, right? Um, but let me talk a little bit about the uh, data type, right? So you have each node uh, that is uh, U in 64. So this represents like, uh, like for a maker order, right? 
this is the liquidity uh, amount that you put in uh, like a, a single maker order right uh, is like a single note right so uh, it is of type uin64 uh, you can therefore store four nodes in a group right because you know uh, each slot is uin uh, 256 right bytes 32 right uh, one thing to note is that uh, the total will be kept at uh, uin64 as well right so uh, over here, right, uh, there were two overflow checks done, right? First is that uh, the individual, individual node or the individual maker order cannot exceed uh, type UN64.max, uh, right? So you, that you can, cannot exceed uh, this uh, uh, UN64, right? And there was another check done uh, to ensure that the total uh, cannot exceed uh, this uh, number as well, right? So if we look into the code itself, you can see that uh, this node dot 60 get 64 of the node and then you add clean uh that's uh overflow check number one we'll look at what add clean does exactly in the next slide uh and for overflow check number two you know you check whether the total will exceed this uh you in 64 type then you would revert uh, because uh, you have a max error right so regarding the add clean function you can see that the overflow check uh, number one is done there right so uh, that should catch it. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, over. We scrutinize uh, the overflow check number two, right? If you recall, it was checking the total, right? To not exceed the uh, UN64. And uh, over here, we see that it does some pack unsafe, right? Uh, hmm, wait a minute, it's doing unsafe addition here, right? So, what would happen if overflow happened here, right? Then you know, overflow check number two wouldn't actually catch it because it has already happened, right? And uh, so we can see uh, an example here where this is the top layer, right? Um, where if you sum the nodes in the top layer, you, know, you, you could overflow, right? And individually, they are okay, right? Because individually, they don't exceed you in 64. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you sum them up in the top layer, then you could have this overflow. Right, so uh, that's like uh, the bug really, uh, the addition overflow uh, issue here. And so, you know, you write a test case and you kind of like uh, do the POC and make sure that uh, you check that definitely you can see that the total was asserted to be equal to zero. And so you, you did have an addition overflow, right? So the takeaway uh, over here is that, you know, we should be scrutinizing every check that's performed. Are they done in the right place? You know, can they be bypassed, right? And uh, with uh, the next thing is that you know, could the effect have already taken place before the check is performed, right? So in this case, you can see that uh, overflow already occurred, making the check kind of like useless or redundant, right? And uh, there's some relation here to uh, zero knowledge uh, that I like to point out, right? Because with zero knowledge proofs, you are typically checking a bunch of constraints, right? So um, one thing that you can ask, ask yourself is uh, whether or not it's possible for those constraints to be violated before the checks are performed. And I guess it's not just related to ZK, but in, in general, right? When you're doing like invariant checking, you know, whether it's possible to violate those constraints. Okay, right, so that's the first one. Uh, the second critical that was found uh, has to do with uh, DOS, uh, design of service with uh, blacklistable tokens, for example, USDC, right? So over here, um, the way that they implemented this uh, maker order queue is that at a price index, uh, like I said, it's up to two to the power 15 orders, right? So you could only replace, once you max out, uh, once the order queue is fully filled, uh, then, you know, you kind of have to do like a sort of a replacement Right, and you can only replace uh, fulfilled orders, right? Otherwise, then you take it as you know, still uh, unfilled orders that can be uh, used. That there is still a maker liquidity uh, at those price indexes, right? So um, what they will do is that when you check that you can re uh, replace if the fulfilled if that order to be replaced has already been fulfilled, then it will uh, if that order has not been claimed yet, then what you'll do is they will tend to send funds uh, to that replaced order, right? Uh, so the main issue here is that you could have a denial of service because if you recall, like I said, uh, the maker order is represented by the NFT, right? So if you send the NFT to a blacklisted address, then when uh, the contract tries to send the funds, it would uh, revert, 
right so I think (uh) the main takeaway here is that it's a tussle between pool versus push fund transfers (ppb) (uh) the general rule of time or the recommendation is to use a pool method instead of a push okay (uh) so the next clip has to do with (uh) order order N_F_T theft so if you look at this decode (uh) decode I_D function right (um) what it does is that it takes in this U in two fifty six I_D and then it returns this (uh) order book order key right and (uh) you can see that you know the first the last sorry the (uh) more least significant bits (uh) goes to a the order index first and then goes to the price index and then (uh) the the most significant eight bits (uh) goes to the is bit (uh) met the is bit (uh) variable okay so what really is the problem here right if you take a look at the is bit function (uh) the the is bit (uh) assignment right (uh) you can see that there is some kind of a compression issue right because it is you are checking uh in in a way you're assigning it to a boolean right uh because it does this like uh is bit equal equals one right so uh the thing is that you the left mode eight bits is reduced to a bit comparison right so in other words uh this your if your uh it uh msbs uh is equals to like zero 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 one then it's a bit but for every other representation it's treated as an us right so this by itself isn't really like an issue right uh but the problem is that it this function is used in the nft uh, order of right uh so yeah that's pretty bad right what exactly is uh the result of this it's that you know you kind of uh you're able to uh in a way steal nfts that you are in control because of this like collision in uh, token ids right uh so over here the poc is that uh well to summarize what this poc does is that the attacker is essentially in control of another nft due to this uh, mapping collision right so what they do is the fix over here is that you just have to ensure that its bit is either zero or one right it cannot be anything else okay so uh the takeaway for this uh is that you know you should be asking what are the consequences of unused bits or discarded bits or redundant bits right are they safely ignored you know or you know could you somehow maliciously uh use these bits right and i think this also talks about uh, value collisions that you kind of have to pay attention to right and uh right let's move on this is another issue that sort of uh related to collisions right it has to do with uh again all the nft theft uh with uh, because you're able to control the future and the past tokens right so uh i'll talk a little bit about modulo arithmetic right so x modulo n you know you're mapping numbers from 0 to n minus 1 right uh but you can achieve the achieve the same effect right with x bitwise uh, with, when you do a bitwise n uh with a mask right uh, you're essentially trying to extract the last uh y bits where if n equals to to the power of y right so uh you will see how this applies uh to the code over right um so again we take a look at this order of right it calls this uh it calls the market uh, get order function so if we trace this get order function it calls the internal get order function and then it calls this uh, get queue right so uh what i would like to draw your attention to is uh, this portion over here the order index uh, bitwise and the max order n right and um, it seems okay you know uh, it seems fine really uh, when your when an existing order is being overridden by a looped order so for example when the order index is like 2 to the power of 15 already it's replacing order index 0 right uh, initially we checked that you know sufficient checks were in place you know the state was correctly updated right um, but then what really is a problem here, right? Uh, the existing owner then isn't just the owner for that token, right? It's kind of also the order, it's also the owner for future and past tokens, right? In other words, right, uh, the owner of uh, on the index zero is also the 
owner of all the index uh, to the power 15 and to the power 15 uh, times 2, to the power 15 times 3, and so on and so forth. Right? In other words, you are again given the opportunity to control uh, tokens uh, that you shouldn't be in control of. Right? Uh, so what the attacker can do is that he can set approvals of future token IDs to himself and then you know once that NFT has been minted, you can steal it because you've given approval already. And uh, they, they didn't like clear approvals when you mean cause it, yeah. So um, the takeaway here is to think bi-directional, right? And what do I mean by bi-directional? Because uh, the one way was okay, right? When you, we were checking, like, you are replacing the existing order, you know, uh, you're replacing the existing uh, order NFT, you check the state, it's fine, right? But then I think over here, the important like takeaway for me was that you have to think it's not just uh, replacing, but it's also, oh no, could you somehow be in control of uh, future items that are to be replaced, right? So so that's uh, what I made by my direction over here. And uh, it also has to do with like uh, collisions with modulo arithmetic, right? So what are the consequences of numbers wrapping around, right? And uh, I feel this is, has uh, applications to zero knowledge because of finite prime fields, right? You're dealing with finite prime fields in zero knowledge, right? And I like to highlight a uh, bug that when I was watching a ZK uh, lecture. Um, so this has to do with STEC 2.0, right? So there was this like person uh, hash impacts, right? And uh, you know, uh, over here, right? Um, uh, the the main like issue is also has to do with collisions, right? Because they had uh, every hash input effectively, you know, had uh, two possible representations and then, you know, two different outputs. And so, you know, you were able to have a double spending attack, right? So uh, you can see that there is some kind of like relation with regards to collisions. Um, just to show a little bit, if you would like to uh, learn more about ZK, uh, just check out my pinned tweet. Uh, there's also great resources shared in the ZK channel. And uh, since I'm already sharing some stuff, uh, for those of you who will be watching this recording on YouTube, don't forget to smash the like button on uh, below and subscribe to the Spearbit channel. Uh, every presentation has been banger so far. I've watched, I think, almost all of them, and uh, I always learn something new each time. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's talk about uh, rounding issues, right? So uh, this has to do with uh, uh, rounding of taker fees, right? And uh, Let's say if we see uh, this like calculator taker fee it takes two inputs like output amount and uh, a boolean right so this uh, for filling and claiming the orders right then uh, if we take a look at this like calculate taker fee amount right uh, so it's calculating the fee to be taken and it kind of uh, either rounds down or up in this case it rounds up for both cases uh, in the uh, output amount and uh, in the fee output amount and also in the fee taker amount, right? So, uh, uh, one thing that I would like to point out is that the fees taken from uh, when the order is filled, it all goes to the makers, right? So over here, the output amount is the full taken amount, while the uh, take, well, the take amount is the individual uh, field maker order. Okay, so I, oh, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that you can clearly see that fees are rounded up, right? So uh, one question that I had, right, was that I asked myself whether it was possible uh, for the fees that were collected to exceed the fees that were to be claimed due to rounding, right? So um, let's take a look at an example. If let's say we have a taker fee of, uh, it's 10.0011%. So they use, if I recall, it's like either, I think it's 1 million uh, as the denominator, right? And then we have this like maker orders, right? Of uh, 400,000 and 377,000 uh, uh, respectively, right? So two maker orders. And so therefore the total liquidity uh, is 777,000, right? So let's calculate the fee amount that the taker pays, right? Uh, he pays, um, you know, you just do the math and you can see because it's rounding up, uh, for it is 77,709, right? And in the maker fees, uh, it's also rounded up, right? So uh, when you do the math, then you check it's equal to 37,705 and 40,005 respectively, 
right? And you realize that the total the total maker fees uh is greater by one way, right? So you have an issue here, right? Where uh the fees taken uh the fees that were to be distributed it could potentially exceed the fees that were taken in, right? So the fix is that you would round down uh when you're doing the claim calculation. So instead of rounding up, you round down. I have to move it. Okay, so uh, the takeaway here uh, I, is when you're thinking about rounding issues, right? Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that when you're doing division uh, that's performed across segments, you could have these rounding issues, right? So uh, a classic example would be this, right? 21 divided by 3 is exactly 7, right? Uh, but when it's split, when you split 21 equally, 7, 7, and 7, uh, when you divide by 3, uh, whether or not you round down or up, you don't get seven. Right? In the case when you're rounding down, seven divided by three is two, right? So that's the default solidity uh, output, right? So, but then you take two plus two plus two is six. It's not equal to seven, right? Uh, in the case that you round up, then you know you have nine, which is also not equal to seven, right? So, um, yeah, you do have these kind of round issues when you do division, uh, but you split up the numbers that was to be divided. So that's one thing to take note. Um, another uh, takeaway is, um, so some of the bugs that I found, like this bug in particular that I found, right? Um, it wasn't when I was staring at the code in front of the computer, right? Uh, I, was, I thought of it when uh, I was attending a friend's wedding, uh, when I was waiting for the ceremony to start. You know, my mind just started to wonder about uh, this issue uh, about rounding and, you know, I got a bit excited and I started uh, trying to work out some numbers. So um, usually that's the case for me, right? The bugs that I've, some of the bugs that I find uh, happen when I'm taking a shower, when I'm swimming in the pool, when I'm having my meals. All of these are true examples. Um, yeah, so I think what really uh, the key takeaway here is to build up your mental model. Uh, it could be mental, you know, you, maybe you want to draw diagrams, whatever works for you, right? But try to build that mental model uh, up as soon as possible. The reason is that so that you can allow your mind to do passive but intentional thinking, right? You allow your mind to wonder, right? You need to give yourself to the time to be able to ask the what is, right? Uh, but you can only do that once you have a good understanding of the code base first. So that's important. Build up a good understanding of the code base as fast as possible. And then uh, when you are not staring at the code, uh, when you're having your meals, then that's when you can start thinking about different components and attack factors. Uh, right. So uh, meme over here, right? So when you're going to sleep, then sometimes some random question pops up in your head, right? Um, and then it keeps you up and then you start going back to test and write POCs. Okay, um, another takeaway is to complete the thought process, right? Uh, so let's say you didn't like really find a bug, right? In this case, like maybe the rounding issue wasn't, wasn't really a bug, for example, for instance, right? Um, maybe try to like complete why exactly, uh, complete the thought process and uh, note down why exactly you thought it wasn't a bug, right? And there could be some assumptions that you make and you uh, can consider revisiting these assumptions another time, right? So uh, I'll give an example here, right? Let's say uh, the project that you're auditing uses chaining oracles, right? So you check, there are sufficient checks that the timestamp is fresh, right? Against a certain uh, threshold, right? Say an hour, right? So, you know, you say it's safe, right? Because uh, timestamp not equal zero, right? But then, uh, have you considered whether or not, I mean, when you come back again, when you challenge this assumption, right, uh, of this, like, uh, this timestamp freshness check, right, and then you ask, okay, is it, like, really, have I read, considered all angles, and then you realize, oh, no, actually, I didn't consider the heartbeat of the oracle, right? Um, for example, some oracles, like, example, uh, on L2s, right, they could have very long heartbeats, like, up to 24 hours. So maybe that wasn't taken into account. So that something can either raise to the team or you can uh, ask the team members about it and whether they think it's an issue, right? Uh, another thing uh, about the, uh, another area is uh, you can ask yourself whether the problem exists in another part of the code, of the code base in a different form. 
so an instance of this uh, is actually uh, this bug, this rounding issue, right? Uh, I was a little bit disappointed in myself for not catching uh, a separate issue, but it's very similar uh, before the clobber team did, right? So uh, this was the issue. It, also, it was also a rounding error, right? Um, when, so you could specify like uh, whether you want exact input or you want exact output. It's very similar to UniV3 in a sense, right? Uh, so when you are specifying exact output, then you know you would, because fees are taken, uh, you, you, take, you deduct from the output amount. So then you know you kind of have to increase the output amount first, right? So that's what the first chunk does, right? Um, and then, you know, uh, it will do the rounding up uh, of the taking of fees uh, in, uh, when you're iterating through the liquidity, right? So you can see that it's actually in a while wow loop, right? So it's possible that you are deducting, uh, you're rounding up fees multiple times, but then uh, you only rounded up the requested amount once, right? So it's very similar. You round up once, but then in like, you have a separate case where uh, the amount to be deducted is rounded up multiple times. So you come into the same issue where you could, uh, you are taking your, uh, uh, there's uh, insufficient uh, fees, or in this case, there's insufficient uh, output amount, right? So uh, the issue is that uh, if you specify the market, you want to take uh, the, you want to fill the order with um, X band output, um, it will revert because uh, of, of this issue, right? Okay, so uh, quickly, just a few other issues to, to talk about. Uh, this one has to do with the other NFT. It has to do with the state um, uh, of the uh, state handling, right? Uh, of the uh, other NFT, right? So after cancelling an order or when you're claiming a maker order, the token is burnt, right? Because, you know, there's it's pretty much worthless, you can burn it, right? Um, but the issue here is that the uh, order owner wasn't zeroed out, so the owner of will still return the current owner. And uh, what this kind of led to was that you could somehow resurrect a burnt token because owner of still kind of belongs to you, so you could save transfer, you could do a save transfer from. Yeah, uh, that's uh, one of, uh, that's an issue. Right. Uh, another issue has to do with uh, decoupling of NFT and market ownership. So in this case, uh, the market host or the one who created the market, uh, whose address is stored in the factory, right? He's entitled to 80% of the fees collected. Uh, separately, you have the other NFT owner. So it's the it's uh, the one who created the other NF who deployed the other NFT, right? He's able to set the URI, so it was ownable, right? So technically, both should be pointing to the same address but you could be transferring the market host or the other NFT uh, owner without transferring the other. So it could be either or, but not both. In this case, you want both to be transferred uh, at the same time, right? So I, um, yeah, uh, you could see this as the fix. So I won't go too much into it, right? So the takeaway here is that it's easy to spot what's wrong with the present code, right? Because it's easy to spot what's wrong in front of you, right? But I think the challenge really is to spot what's absent, what's not there, right? In this case, like the owner not being zeroed out, I think that was a little bit difficult to spot because that line simply doesn't exist, right? So it's, it's usually quite hard to spot things that are absent. Right, and um, regarding state handling, right, I think Zach uh, in his uh, presentation, his community workshop, he, he did point this out as well. When you are transferring assets, right, um, especially when you're transferring assets, uh, whether it's tokens, uh, NFTs, uh, one thing you should be very mindful of is uh, state handling regarding the, uh, such transfer. Uh, so the state handling when you're transferring these assets is all any everything that should be updated have is it updated, right? Um, so an example here is like liquidity mining uh, reward accounting. So uh, I if I recall there was a hack that uh, happened. I I don't recall when. Uh, I also don't recall what project it was, right? Um, but uh, you could transfer like the tokens that rep represent vault shares, right? Uh, but the reward per share accounting was done at per at a per user level, right? So the reward like claim per share for the receiver could be zero, like because it's a new owner, 
uh, it wasn't initialized, right? So then it kind of allowed the user to claim way more rewards than uh, was expected. So yeah, you know, in a way, it was like a mismatch in terms of uh, accounting there. But you know, it's, it's something to think about uh, or to scrutinize when you're looking at uh, ownership transfers. Right. So a few other takeaways. Um, first of all, scrutinize code changes. Right. So a couple of bugs that were found were introduced uh, after the audit started because the team introduced like new changes. Right. Uh, so every, if they do like uh, update the code uh, while you're still doing while you're while still in audit, uh, do scrutinize those changes very thoroughly. Uh, and if you're in doubt about how the code behaves, uh, you either number one ask your fellow team members for help, uh, or you can clarify with the client. Right. So in this case, there was an issue that was uh, spotted. Uh, it has to do with the claim functionality, right? So initially it was uh, designed to support, the intention is that is to support third party operators that anybody can kind of do like claims for makers, right? Uh, so in this case, instead of reverting, uh, if let's say the order has already been claimed, you know, you should be skipping it, right? So um, I think this is, would probably be something that you can only spot if you have a uh, better understanding of the expected behavior, right? And the last thing I like to talk about is, I think the key takeaway really is communication, right? So whether it's communication with the client, whether it's communication with your team members, uh, there are some bugs that arose from discussion with the client, right? Because they can provide more context on how they expect the functions to be used. Uh, and they can provide better uh, clarity uh, about the uh, intentionality of, of how of why they designed it this way and uh, it gives you a better understanding right so with this like knowledge right then you'll be able to discover like deviant behavior uh, like things that are not work not working according to spec right and uh, communication with your team right so you might not be able to figure out how exactly to exploit an issue um, but maybe if you raise it up to your team members, uh, they might be able to help you instead. So uh, they could, for example, help challenge any of the assumptions that you made about why you didn't think uh, something wasn't an issue. Uh, so again, communication, I cannot stress how important this is. Um, communication, communication, communication. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, do uh, ping me. Uh, and I think we can, we have some time for Q&A. So, yeah, we can proceed with that. Oh, differences. Um, okay, uh, I would say in terms of complexity, this audit was a little bit more challenging, uh, especially with the custom data structures that they use because it's designed from scratch, right? So you don't have a base of comparison. Usually, let's say you are audit, auditing like a fork, at least there are usually like familiar components that you have seen before, like usually they're inheriting from Open Zeppelin or Soulmates library, right? But in this case, pretty much everything was from scratch. So I think uh, that was challenging. Uh, second of all, why it was challenging was because um, there were like some optimizations that they did, uh, like some magic numbers they used that it took a while to understand. So. Uh, this was definitely a, a bit more on uh, the fun side and the more technical side of things. Yeah, uh, what else? Yeah, I think with regards, the other thing was really the modulo arithmetic with regards to uh, the order indexes. So I think that was, it showed how uh, you have to be careful with modulo arithmetic. Um, and then if you use it in uh, an owner of function, yeah, I think things can go really, really bad. So that was one takeaway there as well. Yeah, um, so audits usually, you know, your time box, right? Either it's, uh, yeah, it's usually determined either uh, by the protocol, by third parties, uh, that like audit contest, for example. Um, so sometimes you don't really, with that fixed amount of time, you really want to have a good understanding of the code base as soon as possible, right? So I think the methodologies of how you reach that state is something that you need to explore for yourself. 
at the end of the day you have to find what works for you right for me i think uh i do read documentation first if it's provided and then i jump uh, into the code base so i don't like go line by line immediately i skim okay. through yeah i i skim i skim through uh, the code base just to be able to build that high level overview as fast as possible and then uh, that's when uh, you start to do line by line or like when you don't understand something uh, then that's when you start to go a little bit deeper so it's really trying to understand uh, as fast as possible and how you achieve that you have to find what works for you like some for, for some people it's like building uh you the uml diagrams or you know it's it's mind maps all all over the place right so explore what works and for each individual it's different but uh, once you find something that clicks uh, you can either stick to it or you can continue exploring to find what works best yeah i would say in this specific audit okay so i did encounter some issues with rounding before from experience right uh so and i knew that uh when it comes to exchanges uh sometimes the rounding issues could be a problem and uh, i didn't pay close attention to that but i knew it was something i had to dive into eventually right um so yes there was that pattern in that sense that i used to recognize this like rounding issue bug um for the other bugs i think probably yeah i i hmm. I would say not really for this uh in this particular audit yeah there wasn't really any recognizable patterns um but then again it really uh, it's good to have a solid understanding of commonly used components so like you know open zeppelins uh whether it's upgradable or it's the classic uh, versions um so me so once you are familiar with that, then you kind of uh, are aware of the nuances and uh, with that kind of, in that sense, quote, quote, pattern recognition, I, yeah, um, pattern recognition, then you can sort of apply that uh, to whatever you're auditing. Yeah, uh, tools that are used. So VS Code, it's usually a lot of manual reviews. Uh, Foundry is definitely a critical, critical component. Recently, I've done quite a bit of integration testing. So if, say, the project is using uh, an existing project, it builds upon an existing project. For example, say, Euler, oh, sorry, it's Euler, right? Euler Finance or uh, it's Compound or RV, you know, uh, then you at least want to make sure that you if the project hasn't already provided an integration test it's good to write those up yourself because uh there has been instances where i found some issues uh because uh from as a result of writing some uh, integration tests uh so yeah in that sense the foundry tooling yeah i think uh some fast testing uh i've used fast fast uh testing as well i haven't really got to invariant testing yet uh, it's something on my to-do list uh, to be familiar with that. So pretty much um, anything that has to do with Foundry. Yeah, uh, I know some people use formal verification. So uh, I think those will be quite useful as well, if you have the time, of course, uh, to use those tools. E yes, okay, so uh, I'd just like to expound a little bit on, about on this. Uh, so usually they would provide unit testing, right? That's like the foundation usually, uh, the most common type of test that a uh, project will provide. So if you think there is an issue, uh, do take a look at the test to see whether that issue has been covered in tests. So sometimes you think it's an issue, but then uh, it was actually covered by a test case, right? Uh, you can scrutinize the test case to see whether it's according to spec. Right? Sometimes it's not, and then that's when you can point that issue out. Yeah. Uh, but with uh, the developer's test, I think it also helps to very easily build upon what they've written. 
Uh, so uh, if let's say you want to write a POC, then you can use their existing uh, framework already. So uh, I do like again to stress on the importance of uh, being of familiarity with uh, dev tooling, right? So Foundry, Hat Hat, uh, I think Brownie if you're looking to Viper as well. Yeah, so be familiar with those. It's critical. Awesome. Thank you, guys. It uh, was a pleasure being able to present. All right. See you all. Bye-bye.